Good morning. Welcome everybody to today's Learn at Lunchtime Adventures in Nature Lab program. I am Beth Erickson from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Our topic today is the wild dogs of Pennsylvania and with us is Thomas Keller, fur bearer biologist for the Pennsylvania Game Commission's Bureau of Wildlife Management. Mr. Keller oversees the management of 15 species of animals in Pennsylvania, ranging from the least weasel to the coyote. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Beth. Thanks so much for having me. So take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so as Beth said, I'm the fur bear biologist. And what that means is um, I oversee uh, these 15 species throughout the state. So it's a statewide program. And uh, it's, it's it, as the Game Commission's mission is to um, ensure that we're properly managing these species for everyone's enjoyment. And so um, that can, on a day to day can mean surveys in the field or writing reports or all kinds of different things throughout the year. So that's uh, that kind of gives you a real brief idea of, of what I do. Um, but it's it's a great job and I'm very privileged to be able to serve Pennsylvanians in this role. So you're going to share with us today some information about the wild dogs that we find here in our state. So what wild dogs do we have in Pennsylvania? Yeah, so the ones that we're going to be talking about primarily will be the gray fox, the red fox, and the eastern coyote. Um, I'll also be touching on gray wolves because that was a kind of a more recent um, extirpation of wild dogs here in Pennsylvania, and I think it's important that we cover them as well. Great. Let's go ahead and tell us more. You can tell us more about these wild dogs. You got it. And so when I when I brought up this picture, I would just wanted to kind of have everyone think about the wild dog that you might have in your home um, or maybe your family or friends have. And uh, we're going to try to kind of understand where these dogs came from because they all did originate with wild dogs. But before we get too deep into the weeds as far as the wild dogs that we have here in Pennsylvania, I think it's important that we realize um, what makes up a dog. And so uh, some of the important characteristics are these elongated muzzles. Um, and this really kind of, it's gonna teach us more about dogs and what makes them special and stand apart from other families and other species. Um, but these elongated muzzles tell us that this, this particular family uh, has a very specialized sense of smell. And so kind of as an example, when we, when we come into a, a kitchen and we smell something baking, and we'll say it's either a pie or maybe a stromboli or something like that, all we smell is that stromboli. And we say, man, that smells good. Um, but what a dog actually smells when they come into the room is each individual ingredient. And so that's kind of a, just an easy way to think about how um, specific and, and specialized their sense of smell is. That's important for finding prey, for finding food, um, and also for finding mates. And so the next thing we see is these long legs. And we think of domestic dogs, it's easy to think of some of the dogs that we've bred down to have short legs, like some of our beagles, uh, dots, and things like that. Um, but when we think of our wild dogs, they have these very long legs and they're actually walking on their toes. And so we think of their foot as actually their toes. And what this tells us, along with kind of how their body is shaped, we see a kind of a sturdy front end where it kind of slims down into their back hips and then muscular rear hips is for basically running um, quickly. So for speed and it's for chasing down prey over long distances. Um, we also see in all the, all the wild dogs, we see these bushy tails this helps with thermoregulation um, as well as keeping them warm in the winter time. And then we see these specialized jaws. And so we see these very muscular jaws. And in reality, what really sets these apart is their dentition. And dogs have this a special dentition or teeth that is designed to shear muscle and bone. Um, and, and oftentimes you'll see that, obviously, if you have a family dog, you can see how it can eat bones. Um, and that's obviously the same in the wild with fox and coyotes um, and wolves. And so I do wanna point out that the family is the canidae family or the canids or what we say as often as canines. And that's generally split into two kind of subfamilies, the canini or the true dogs. These are our wolves, coyotes and domestic dogs. And then we have the foxes which are often split even further. 
So when we think back to where kind of the dogs originated from, it's from the Oligocene epoch, which is about 33 million years ago. And um, when we think specifically about Pennsylvania, some of the earliest records we have um, of, of dogs showing up in Pennsylvania is actually the dire wolf, which was during the Pleistocene epoch, um, quite a, a bit of a time difference um, after the Oligocene. Uh, but these were located in the Frankstown Cave in Hollidaysburg Fisher, which is just south of Altoona in Blair County. Um, and, and the dire wolf has kind of seen some more recent uh, popularity in, in the show Game of Thrones. Uh, when we think about the size of the dire wolf, in reality, it was probably uh, slightly bigger than the gray wolf, um, but certainly not the giant that we often see depicted in, in television or cartoons and things like that. So again, I, I put recent canids up here because the gray wolf is no longer in Pennsylvania. It's been extirpated, which means it's no longer um, a breeding sustainable population here in the state. And so the three that we do have here, though, are gray fox, red fox, and coyote. And I think this slide's important um, to kind of give you that difference between all of the species here. And so when we look at the gray fox on the left side here, we see this salt and pepper kind of grayish color on the back, tail, and on the head. And it has this black stripe that kind of runs down the top of the tail with a black tip of the tail. The tail is fairly long in relation to the body, has a kind of a reddish orangish highlights along the, the bottom. Um, and then we see a little bit of a white throat patch. Uh, the second one here, the red fox, um, is slightly larger. So the gray fox, when we think about kind of shoulder height compared to a human, that's probably about halfway up your calf of, a, of an average adult human. Um, the red fox is going to be a little bit larger. So the, the top of the shoulder will probably just be under the knee, um, around the knee of, of an average adult human. And with the red fox, although we do see some color variation, we'd see this generally rusty red color on top uh, that extends down the sides, extends down the tail. Oftentimes there's a white tip on the tail, but that's not always the case. Um, but we also see uh, these black socks uh, that the red, sock, the red fox wears, and that's a uh, pretty telltale even at a distance that it's a red fox. I'm gonna jump over to the coyote and the coyote um, this is kind of the typical color pattern, and we'll talk a little bit later about um, some of the different color patterns, but this um, is showing this kind of brownish, um, sometimes a little bit of reddish underneath um, throughout, and this kind of gray color up onto the head and around the neck. Uh, with the coyote, it's generally, you see the kind of like a sloping from the front shoulder to the rear, and then they have this uh, fluffy tail that kind of hangs down. Coyotes are most often confused with, with dogs, particularly German shepherds. Uh, so if you see something out in the field, at first glance, oftentimes you might think it's a German shepherd. It kind of has a lot of the same, the same look as a, as a shepherd. Um, they have this kind of pointy nose and these very pointy ears. And of course, these pointy ears you can see are on all four of these species and are very common to the wild dogs. And then we have the gray wolf. Gray wolf's actually quite a bit larger in size than the coyote. Coyote uh, shoulder length uh, or shoulder height would probably come about halfway um, between your knee and your waist, whereas a gray wolf uh, shoulder length would be up to an average human's waist. So it's a very large wild dog. The gray wolf, um, some of the telltale, they have a lot of different color colorations. Uh, but some of the telltale signs is to look at that face. And so we don't see quite the pointy face. It's more of a rounded face, uh, particularly just below the ears. You can see how that fur uh, rounds out around the face there. Um, and again, size is just one of the major, um, major kind of differences there between those two. So we're going to start with the gray wolf. Um, when we look back at the prehistoric record, the fossil record, we see uh, pretty well a, a continuous uh, record from a long, long time ago, and even up into our, his, our historical records, where we had wolves in the state. Um, and, and so then, unfortunately, when humans began to settle the state, we saw this very intense persecution 
through hunting and trapping and poisoning and any way that humans could get rid of wolves, uh, they did, and primarily to protect livestock as we began to settle throughout the state and, and bring livestock in. And here's a map on the right here that you can see. And if you can't see the, the numbers there, that's okay. This is from uh, Carnegie Museum. And the bottom line there is 1850, and then the, the years go up from there. So 1860, 70, 80, and to 90. And what you're seeing here is kind of um, the, the wolf population. These are the black dots are all records of, of wolves being harvested or found. And so uh, you can see how this range is kind of restricted into that northern tier into what we call the Pennsylvania wilds now, where a lot of the habitat persisted until it was finally cut over in the late 1800s. Um, and so that's when we feel we lost the last wolf in 1892. We still certainly get a lot of um, sightings today as far as from the general public. Unfortunately, most of those um, are coyotes or some other um, wild dog of some type. We, we have, don't have any recent records of wolves in Pennsylvania um, because they've been extirpated. And, and so um, you know, we do work with the public to let them know that um, likely it wasn't a wolf. Uh, on occasion, we will see uh, captive wolves either escaped or released. And, um, and so those occasionally will make up a sighting here or there. But in general, um, that's not the case. Uh, with with most wolves. And uh, at this point, I'd like to play a, a sound bite for you, some wolves howling. I just want you to think about, um, you know, wherever you live in Pennsylvania, what this might sound like if you listen to this. Uh, you're out in the yard at some point one night or out in the woods. And so I don't know what uh, what type of emotion or feeling that that might have caused, but I think as humans, that definitely um, deep down, you know, in in ourselves, that definitely elicits some type of a response, whether fear or whether um, just amazement or something. But I can tell you, if you've ever been in wolf country, it definitely gives you a different perspective. Um, compared to where we live here in Pennsylvania without wolves. The next uh, wild dog we want to cover is the gray fox. This is, again, our smallest um, wild dog in Pennsylvania. It prefers primarily wooded habitat. And really, when we break that down even more, it's just really thick, um, shrubby, brushy areas um, that are found within the woods or in the forest. You will see them sometimes occasionally out uh, in farmland. but but not generally. Um, and and uh, one of the specializations of the gray fox, which I think is pretty neat, is that it has these semi-retractable claws that allow it to actually climb trees. And so it's our only wild dog that can do that here in Pennsylvania. And um, there's a couple of different reasons why it would do that. One is to escape other predators like coyotes. Um, and another is to actually access food. So it gives this this wild dog an advantage um, over others that it can access food up in the trees, such as soft mass like fruit, um, or even um, you know potentially squirrels or other rodents, um, bird nests, that kind of thing. They are omnivorous, just like uh, the coyotes and the red fox. They'll eat just about anything they can come across. They're they're not picky, um, and this allows them to do very well. Unfortunately, we have seen a population decline over the gray fox range here, particularly in the, the northeast and the upper Midwest. Um, and so that's something where nobody has a really good idea or, or good um, feeling for why that is. But that's something that as researchers, we're beginning to look at and hope to continue to focus on within the next um, couple of years here. So I'm actually going to exit out of the screen view because I want to play you a sound of the gray fox. It's maybe something you've heard before and you just weren't sure. So listen closely. So that can uh, certainly if you're outside and, and you uh, 
would hear that in the middle of the night, that might make you jump um, pretty quickly. And uh, so it's it's some one of those things that get, often gets confused with other species, you know, particularly um, the cats or fisher or things like that. But in reality, that's what you're hearing. Uh, we're going to jump into the red fox. So this is probably one of the more common foxes that most folks have seen because they do kind of stand out. They're more of a farmland or grassland habitat specialist. And so they, that's certainly what they prefer and where we see our highest densities um, is in these farmland areas. And they're very adaptable to human development. And so we see uh, red fox, particularly when I think of kind of close, close to where we live down in Baltimore, Baltimore County, they have some extremely high densities of, of red fox down there because they're so adaptable. Again, they're very, um, very much so omnivores and they can take advantage of many, many different foods, which gives them that adaptability. And one thing I do want to mention with red fox is, is when they change their pelts, particularly when they're coming into the spring season, they lose a lot of that really fluffy, bushy hair that we often associate them with. And then uh, they look pretty skinny. And so oftentimes people think that's mange. Occasionally it is, particularly when it's down to the skin. Um, but, but oftentimes it's just them putting a summer coat on. Here we see a photo. Uh, this is more like a time lapse kind of photo of a red fox. Red fox have uh, amazing hearing, as do the other canines. And they can actually hear a mouse under the snow um, up to 150 feet away. And so what this fox is doing is trying to locate that, that uh, rodent under the snow, and then they make a leap and they actually dive under the snow to capture it. Um, so it's a very amazing hunting technique and they're, they're actually pretty good at it. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna jump out again because I'd like to, like to show you the, the red fox sound. This is again, another one, particularly if you live in kind of open country farmland in the Southeast, South Central, that you may have heard before, but wasn't sure what it was. So listen closely. And now we're gonna hear some more of the, the single barks. And this is a little more common of what you might hear. And that single bark is, is oftentimes what I'll hear in the summer or into the winter time. So that's the red fox. Again, that often confused with a lot of um, other wildlife species. Now we'll get into the coyote and finish up with the coyote. Um, we have actually a lot of folks um, are under the impression that coyotes are fair, fairly recent um, kind of member of the wild dog family that's come into Pennsylvania. But in reality, we actually do have some prehistoric records of coyotes in Pennsylvania. Um, and, and again, kind of out towards that Blair County area. But we lost them for some reason. Um, my assumption would be maybe wolves. Wolves and coyotes um, are, are kind of common enemies. And so it may have been that wolves pushed them out or some other reason, we don't know. Um, but what we see or what we've seen here is uh, coyotes starting as early as the, the uh, early 40s in Pennsylvania, we started to get um, coyotes coming into the state. And we see these coyotes coming in from the Western side, the Western states where we think of coyote uh, range and moving across um, the upper Midwest, and then of course through Indiana, Ohio. But then at the same time, we also had coyotes that started to move up through the Great Lakes states and into Canada. And, and at least through genetic testing, what we see or what is apparent is that these coyotes began to interbreed with wolves. And so that's where we get these larger coyotes with a little bit of a different, uh, different behavior. We see them starting to pack up a little bit more. Um, and so these, what we call Eastern coyotes came down through Canada, through New York, and kind of met with these Western coyotes in what we call the contact zone in Pennsylvania. And so uh, Pennsylvania is very interesting. In the Northeast here, we have these Eastern coyotes. They're much larger. Um, and again, they have some behavioral differences some, from some of their Western cousins. They are uh, very highly adaptable. So we see coyotes filling in 
all kinds of different habitat types and particularly doing well in places um, that are highly developed by humans. And Chicago is a great example where they have a very strong and high dense um, coyote population right in the inner city of Chicago. Um, and they are, again, omnivorous. They take advantage of everything that they can. And they have an interesting uh, part of their reproductive strategy. When they, when they get a lot of um, uh, harvest, we'll say, where, where they're persecuted in areas in the West for livestock predation, um, and, and their numbers are knocked way down, what coyotes will actually do is actually have more pups uh, when, they, when they do have pups. So I actually see an increase in the number of pups that they'll have, and that's to kind of offset the number that are lost. So just a very interesting, interesting um, wild dog that we have here in Pennsylvania. There are multiple color phases that we see. Um, these aren't very common, but you can see in the top left here, we have a very dark one, which makes it look very much like a dog, um, a domestic dog. And then the top right one that almost looks more like a wolf. It has those wolfish colors, that gray and white. And then uh, bottom left, you see one that's fairly white. We've had some albino coyotes that are, um, that are harvested here in Pennsylvania or seen in Pennsylvania. And then, of course, we have some that are fairly reddish colored. Um, so these are all, all our coyotes, um, but they all have this different color phase. And then a few things that I wanted to cover, kind of some of the myths versus truth that surround coyotes. Um, one is, is common that we hear that um, our agency or other agencies are actually the ones that brought coyotes into Pennsylvania and are continuing to bring them in. And, and that's just not true. We, we don't um, we don't bring coyotes into Pennsylvania for any reason. They just have naturalized um, into the state, uh, kind of how we had described there earlier. And then again, another one is, is that the, they are, um, you know, predating all livestock and pets and things like that. And that certainly does occur in some cases, but it's generally an individual coyote here or there. Most are, are, not, um, are not killing pets or not killing livestock. Uh, but occasionally that can happen. And then the third is this koi dog. And so that's a coyote and domestic dog mix. And we, we hear that often that there's um, koi dogs throughout the state that a lot of folks are seeing them. In reality, when we do the genetic testing, it's very rare. It does happen occasionally. Um, so I certainly don't want to write it off, but it's not something that happens often. It's, it's a very rare anomaly that we see. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to play the coyote sound, and I want you to listen and think when you're listening, how many coyotes you think are making this sound? So that, um, that is the sound of coyotes howling and yipping. And that's often what we hear, particularly like summer nights or sometimes into the fall and the winter. Um, it, a lot of folks think, my goodness, there's a whole pack of coyotes out there. In reality, that was probably two, three at the most. Um, we don't see these large packs of coyotes very often. Um, what, what we often see are two to three animals uh, together at a time when we hear that. And so, um, so that's kind of another interesting myth that we often hear. So just to wrap up, we, I just want to talk a little bit about canine encounters, um, some of the disease threats that certainly canines have the ability to, these wild canines have the ability to carry your rabies, mange, and distemper. So I just want to encourage you, if you're a pet owner, make sure your dogs, you know, are vaccinated for these things. Um, it's, it's not often that canines are carrying these things. Sometimes you'll see in very localized populations where something like mange might break out, um, but, but it's something to be aware of. Um, if you ever see it, uh, something that's not acting right, you can give us a call and I'll provide some information at the end here. Again, we talked a little bit about pets and livestock, and a lot of that's just our responsibility as pet and livestock owners. Um, my wife and I are, have sheep, and so we very careful about how we protect our sheep 
as well as pets. And so it's important as, as owners that we be responsible. Feeding, if you're feeding anything outside, it's a good idea to bring that food in overnight um, because again, these are omnivores and they're very adaptable and they'll take advantage of that. And then if you see one in the wild, just to give it lots of space, there's no reason to get close to it. Just enjoy the, the fact that it's there. So with that, I just want to wrap up. Um, you know, I think this is kind of a powerful image. And, uh, and I want to just kind of read you a quick quote here. There are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. And that's from Aldo Leopold, who's often considered the, the father of wildlife management, uh, modern wildlife management. And so as we think about that, and I think probably like myself, most of you folks that are listening to this are those folks that cannot live without wild things. And, and all these wild dogs that we talked about are part of these wild things that we enjoy so much. Um, and, and they're all a very important part of the ecosystem. And it's important to remember that and, and maybe shed some of these, um, you know, the previous thinking of our previous generations to persecute these uh, particular species. So with that, Here's our wild dog again, a little bit more grown up now. Here's my contact information. I'd encourage you if you have any questions um, and concerns, things that we don't get to today, um, feel free to reach out to me and then uh, and, and I'd be happy to speak with you. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Beth. That was great. Thank you so much for that information. One listener thought that the fox call sounded like a bird, which I agree mm. with. I, I did hear that. And the coyotes howling was so haunting. Mm. It's amazing the sound that only a couple coyotes can make. That's great. Yeah. Well, we do have several questions. Um, one we'll start with, is mange or rabies from foxes or coyotes a concern for spreading to domestic animals? It can be. So if you live in, a, in an area where um, particularly if it's a highly developed area and you have a population of fox or coyote that you know are using the same space that your pets are using, it can certainly be a concern. And that's where I think the importance of, you know, cleaning up our scraps, keeping food, you know, bringing food in every night so that you don't have these common areas where you have uh, the wild dogs using as the same as your domestic dogs. That's a very important thing to consider. That makes sense. Another one, which I think a lot of us who look at these animals and see how beautiful they are, wonder, can a wolf be a pet? Yeah, it's not a good idea. Anytime you take a wild animal, even if it's raised from a very young age, um, there's just this instinctual wildness within them that is never a good idea. I've seen it done, but what often happens is um, they get to a size where people can't afford to feed them anymore or take care of them, um, or they begin, begin to become aggressive. And, uh, and at that point, people are often, you know, the, the choices are to give it to a wolf sanctuary, which are often overrun with the number of wolves they have, to euthanize it, which is, is not a great option for the animal itself, or to turn it loose into the wild, which is, again, more of a death sentence for that animal in particular, because they weren't raised in the wild. That makes sense. Um... Another question from our listener is, is it unusual to see coyotes and foxes during the day? That's a great question. One we get a lot of, we get a lot of calls. Um, it Again, it depends. If you're in more of a rural area, then yes, it can be a little bit more unusual. It's it, Often I do see them when I'm out and about doing research or traveling from one area to another, um, particularly red fox. You'll see them out and occasionally coyotes. Um, but if you live in an urban area where you have these animals, it's a lot more common. They're used to humans, they're used to traffic, um, they're used to domestic animals that are out there. And so they can, they'll actually become less nocturnal and more diurnal using that daylight hours to hunt. Um, what I would say to pay attention to would be just acting in, in abnormal ways. So they can't walk in a straight line, they're falling over, um, things like that. They're being really aggressive towards something or someone, then it's time to give us a call or give your local police department a call. Are there particular reasons why the wild dogs, the coyotes and the foxes would bark and howl? Yeah, so often there's a lot of different reasons that they communicate. Um, they're often very territorial, so they're allowing other 
um, other individuals or other pairs uh, to let them know where their territory is at to stay away. There might be part of a family unit, so they're actually calling in parts of their family into a central location. Um, so there's a lot of different communication that occurs, um, and those are those are two of the primary reasons that you hear it. Can the wild dogs communicate with domestic dogs? One of our listeners mentioned mm. that their dogs go crazy when they hear the coyotes. That's a great question, and that I'm not 100% sure of if there's if there's like a, a if they're able to actually understand exactly what's going on um, between between the species there or the subspecies. I'm not sure, but it's a good question. And you're right. A lot of times when you hear um, coyotes start to howl, you oftentimes will hear other domestic dogs start to howl as well. So this is an interesting question. I did not know this. So a question of specifically about foxes that have been domesticated or raised by humans. Mm -hmm. Why is their tail lower like a domesticated dog? Well, often foxes carry their tails lower, um, and and I'm not sure why they wouldn't. You know, I'm not sure why a lot of our domestic dogs have. You see a lot of tails that kind of go straight up or straight back. I think some of those are bred for for hunting, like like our dog here is a setter, and so that tail is oftentimes an indicator of where she's found a bird. Um, whereas foxes. You know, oftentimes you see the tail that almost drags on the ground. It's not, it's held up off the ground. Um, and I don't know if that's more for balance or why that might be, but that's a good question. And I'm not sure I have a really good answer for you. I always say when you when we don't know for sure, that's a good research project for somebody to for do sure. and, and yeah. find out some more information. Absolutely. Well, often we find animals in our yard and there's probably come a time where somebody's found an injured fox. Mm. What do we do? So we have a, one of the listeners said, is there a safe way to help an injured fox? If you see one limping in a field, do you leave food? What, what can you do for them? Yeah, that's not generally a great idea is to leave food for it. Um, oftentimes what you'll see is with these minor injuries, um, they'll actually heal up uh, fairly quickly. And so we see that in some of our harvested animals, we can see where they have old wounds um, that have healed fairly quickly. And we see that again with deer too, they can, a lot of times they can get impacted by a vehicle and survive. And that's the same for a lot of these um, wild dog species. Yeah, it's, it's not a good idea to, to come in contact or to feed animals because then they become dependent on that food and kind of lose some of that wildness or ability to capture their own food. If it's something in your yard, um, certainly give us a call and, and we can kind of come out, take a look at it and, and maybe help decide whether it's something that a rehabilitator could take care of uh, or, or see what the best options are for that animal. But that's a great question. And you were really helpful in, um, in the chat box. There is um, a number that people can call if they have questions as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all our questions for today. So I want to thank our audience for the questions. Oh, wait, we've got one more. Um, and I, I knew this was going to come. So the question about the koi dog. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, one of the listeners says, we had what my folks suspected was a koi dog when I was growing up out west mm -hmm. that would dig in water. Do coyotes do that here? Hmm. Dig in water. Yeah, I can't say that I've never, I've ever seen that behavior here. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure I can explain why that might be, but that's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting observation and something that I'll keep in mind while I'm out there conducting research to kind of see if I ever see that again. But yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So I think too, um, oh, are the listener said it's because it's so dry out West that maybe they're mm. digging in the water, but, but I, I think. Science has changed so much with now with genetic testing. I think we can learn a lot more about um, the wild animals in general by, by looking at, at the genetics of them to see um, the relationships between the different animals. So absolutely, absolutely. So, so I think we'll, we'll find out more about koi dogs and what's reality and what's fiction going forward. Yeah, so, you're right. That's great. You're right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to our audience for your questions. If you want to explore more about this topic or other topics related to Pennsylvania, visit the State Museum of Pennsylvania's website or the Pennsylvania Game Commission's website. Those links are all in the chat box. I'll put them back in one more time. 
Um, and thank you, Thomas Keller, for sharing this valuable information about the population of wild dogs in Pennsylvania. This has been great. You're welcome. Thanks, Beth. I'm going to put some information up now for our audience to find out about our next topic. So coming up in um, December, we're going to have a conversation with Chris Kemmerer, Chief of Education and Interpretation Section um, for the Bureau of State Parks to talk about the owls that live and migrate throughout Pennsylvania. We're gonna talk about their unique adaptations and characteristics that make these nocturnal predators efficient hunters and the research that's being conducted on owls. So if you would also um, visit our website, we will have other upcoming Learn at Lunchtime programs. Today's program was recorded and will be available on the PHMC YouTube page. Thank you everybody for listening today. We appreciate your attendance and have a great day.